Assalamu alaikum and welcome to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV. Inspirational women. Why is it that so often and almost always we continue talking about men? Noah, Adam, Jacob, the Holy Prophet, Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Surely we have neglected speaking about women. Last week, we spoke about Fatima Zahra, salam alayhi wa sallam. We've also touched on Khadija, salam alayhi wa sallam. And also, we previously mentioned Sayyidah Zainab, salam alayhi wa sallam. But also, there are other figures. Another figure that we should all also talk about. In Shia circles, she is known, but to millions across the globe, she is still unheard of. She is, of course, Umm al-Bani, salam alayhi wa sallam. Often, women have done we have done injustice to women. We do not speak to them. Many non-Muslims also speak about we treating Muslims, Muslim women unfairly and that there is injustice towards them. Let's look at this topic in detail tonight. With me, we have Dr. Sayyidah Manakshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sayyidah Manakshwani. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. It's a privilege once again to have Thank you Thank you, on. it's my pleasure to be here. Um, this great, great lady, um, Umm al-Bani, assalamu alaikum assalam. Um, so rarely we speak about her, apart from the shahadat, as it were. Um, so we'll continue, as it were, talking about inspiration women. But first of all, say now, why should we study this great lady's life? There are immense lessons to be learned from this great lady, and lessons which are all applicable into our lives today. There is an emotional attachment to the lady, as you can see, around the world, many have a great love for Umm al-Banin. But there are certain aspects of her life which are easily applicable as lessons for our life today. There are wives out there who can relate to Umm al-Banin if they study her biography. Okay. There are mothers out there who can relate to Umm al-Banin if they study her biography. If you want to know the meaning of sacrifice and the meaning of patience, and above all else, the meaning of absolute loyalty to the message of the religion of Islam and the family of the Prophet, peace be upon them, nobody exemplified this like Umm al Okay. Because in the 60 years that she lived on this earth, the love that she showed towards the Qur'an and the Ahl al-Bayt is a lesson for all of us that many of us who face difficulties in our life today, uh -huh. there is a lesson for all of us in terms of how to hold on to our beliefs, how to maintain a relationship with the family of the Prophet, peace be upon them. But I think also at the same time, there is a wonderful lesson for many in the world today who have struggled having lost their children right. or lost their families because of war or mm -hmm. other difficult moments. Because when you're looking around the world today, you see that there are many situations where there are people who've lost family members. Sure. And many find it difficult to recover. Those mothers who've lost sons find it difficult to recover. And so what you find as well in studying her life is a personality who went through absolutely everything. She was a mother, she was a wife, she was a widow, a mother who's lost sons, a mother who's lost family. And so many aspects of her life are lessons which I think we can definitely apply to us. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that uh, introduction. If I can just start off um, talking about this notable figure. When was she born and you know, um, what was happening in the Muslim community at that pe in that period, as it were? What, yeah, she was born, uh, according to my research, in the fourth year after Hijrah. Right. Uh, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family at that stage had 
migrated to Medina from Mecca. Okay. And uh, as we know, the calendar when we're saying after Hijrah is on the basis of that migration. Mm -hmm. And what you're having is this community that's being uh, established in Medina. Right. And there are members of tribes either from Mecca or outside of Mecca who are slowly beginning to learn about the message of the religion of Islam by coming to Medina to come and visit the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. Now, mm -hmm. for women at the time, he began to establish this reform process, which he had started in Mecca. Okay. Uh, in Mecca, you already had uh, the call to speak out for the rights of women when it came to, for example, the, the babies that were being buried alive, buried the alive. female babies, female. Yes. Uh, when it came to inheritance, when it came to rights and marriage as well. Right. And so what you have at that time, by the fourth year after Hijrah until about the ninth year after Hijrah, many prominent Arab tribes are converting towards the religion of Islam. Islam. Okay. So even some of the most ardent polytheist tribes, the ones who were steeped in Jahiliya, were now coming towards the religion. You know, you right. find the likes of, for example, uh, Thaqif okay. uh, were affected by the call of someone like Urwa bin Mas'ud, the great-grandfather of Ali al-Akbar. Um, and others who were slowly coming towards the religion, such as Bani Mustalaq, who previously were enemies. Right. So but I would say uh, by the time that she's five years of age, a number of different delegations have come to Medina, visited the Prophet, and have become enamored by him. Okay. Uh, her tribe was also a prominent tribe uh, because, as we know, her name is Fatima bint Huzam al-Kilabiyya. Okay. And the Kilabis were a prominent tribe in Arabian circles. And that is where the link comes between Umm al banin and Shimr bin al Right. Because you know that many times in the Majalis you hear there is a relationship, relationship between yes. uh, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and Shimr where he, he offers this... Um, you know, sanctuary for If I'm not mistaken, the brothers. A great, un great uncle as it were. Well, no, you no. know, I think too many people think the relationship is, is much closer. It's not that close. Oh, okay. You're going back ancestors. But a ma but, maternal but, Yeah, there, there is a relationship somewhere because of Banu Kilab. Right. Uh, so the Kilabis, many of them start coming towards the religion of Islam. Mm -hmm. um, and they are a tribe who are renowned for uh, their warriors and so on. So... In her early days, Islam is being established. It's the land of Medina. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family is now ensuring that this nascent Muslim community is a community where everybody is living by the principles of the religion as much as they can. Okay, yes. okay. So you've spoken about the tribes, as it were, um, and her notable tribal name, as it were. Um, and also her real name being Fatima, as it were. Mm. Um, so her father names her Fatima. Was this a common name in Arabia at that time? Yeah, I, th I think Fatima was a common name in Arabia. Uh, right. If you look, for example, if I was to ask you, for example, uh -huh. let's, let's turn the tables sure. here. If I was to ask you, name me a Fatima who was living at the same time as Umm al-Banin. The obvious one would, of course, be who? Fatima. Fatima right. al-Zahra. Name me another Fatima who was a prominent lady in Islamic history, mother of mm, one of the greatest personalities in the history of Islam, right. who would that be? Another Fatima. Imam Ali's mother. Yes, Fatima, Fatima bint Asad. Asad. Of course. Yeah? So, yes. so you've got Fatima bint Zahra, who was alive at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Fatima bint Asad is another Fatima. Then you've got the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family has a cousin by the name of Fatima. Okay. And I think on the night of Hijrah, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Imam Ali ibn Talib salam, when he sleeps in the bed of the Prophet on the night of Hijrah, mm -hmm. he's asked by the Holy Prophet to ensure that the Fawatim are, um, are brought safely to Medina from Mecca. Yes. So it, it went to highlight to you that it wasn't just one being called Fatima. Okay. So you got Fatima, Fatima bint Asad, Fatima bint Zahra. Fatima, the daughter of Salma, if I'm not mistaken. Fatima, if I'm not mistaken as well, Umar ibn al-Khattab had a sister by the name of Fatima. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here you have another example. And then you've got uh, Fatima, the daughter of Hazam al-Kilabiya. Okay. Uh, so all of this highlighted that Fatima was a common name at the okay, time. Okay, yes. okay, okay, thank you. So 
what when when Fatima Zahra dies, we find that there's a huge gaping gap, as it were, in the life of Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Talib al-Islam. And what exactly happens? What does he do in terms of marriage, as it were, going forward? That's very difficult, and I think that's why Ahl al-Bayt, their lives, many of us can relate to. And when I say that, I mean every aspect of their life is something that anyone can relate to wherever you're living in the world. Mm. There may be, for example, now a father who's watching this program who lost his wife because of, let's say, cancer. Right. And his wife, for example, and him, they had between them four kids. Who can that person relate to? And one of the people you can relate to is Imam Ali alayhi yes. salam. Imam Ali alayhi salam. When Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam passes away, mm -hmm. he's the father of a few orphans. Yes. Um, and these orphans aren't older than eight. Right. And I, I've heard many people always say this line that, how can we relate to Ahl al-Bayt They lived at one time, we live in another. Ahl al-Bayt, the trials they went through are trials which we can relate to. You know, when you lose your wife, it's not easy. No, no. He no. Can't, you can't turn around and say, Imam Ali, uh, well, he's Imam Ali, so he's not going to be affected. You see from the sadness, Absolutely. you know, a flower. Absolutely came from heaven, went to heaven, left its fragrance in my mind. He oh, loved right. Fatima yes. al-Zahra. But when Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam died, then Imam Ali alayhi salam wanted to get married. Okay. And she had requested him to get married. I see. Before she died, she requested. Okay. She had a niece by the name of Amama. Okay. And she said, I want you to marry my niece. Her niece is very close um, and, and, you know, many say that this niece was you know, possibly a step-niece, uh, one of the stepsisters of Fatima, her daughter. Irrespective, Fatima mm -hmm. al-Zahra alayhi salam, she wants Imam Ali alayhi salam to, to marry uh, her niece, so he marries her. Okay. Then, Imam Ali alayhi salam marries Asma bint Umais. Right. Asma bint Umais originally was married to Ja'far al-Tayyar, the brother of Imam Ali alayhi yeah, salam, who inshallah, soon we're going inshallah. to have a show on Ja'far al-Tayyar. Now, Imam Ali alayhi salam's brother Ja'far died in the battle of Mu'tah. Yes. A couple of years before the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family died. When Ja'far died, Asma bint Umais married Abu Bakr. Okay. And... She had a son from Abu Bakr by the name of Muhammad, Muhammad. Yeah. who later on would be amongst the closest companions of Imam Ali. Ali yes, he adopted him, if I'm not exactly. mistaken. Yeah. Muhammad and Asma, Asma remains alive, married to Abu Bakr until Abu Bakr passes away a few years into his caliphate. Right. Imam Ali alayhi salam marries Asma. Asma, as you know, was very close to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. See, see. So Imam Ali marries Asma. And then after Asma, you have another marriage which has to be mentioned. And that right. is the marriage to Khawla bint Ja'far. Right. Khawla bin Ja'far gave him the son by the name of Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyah. Hanafiyah. Okay. 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 So Imam Ali alayhi salam is married mm -hmm. Amama, he's married Asma, he's married Khawla. And then after these he marries Fatima, the daughter of Huzam al Kilabiya. Okay. And this Fatima, no doubt, the way he, he marries her. His brother Aqil deserves a lot of credit. Right. Yes. Okay, okay. So you mentioned Aqil now. So just in terms of Aqil and his, um, his brother um, and a link now, as it were. So the voice of human justice, I mean, Imam Ali al Islam, what exactly was he seeking in this marriage? It's interesting. Um, I... Because he's had notable figures that he's married before and, you know, this is his fourth marriage, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, uh, historians differ on the exact order, but, right, okay. but definitely you're right. What's he looking for? I think the first thing that's interesting about this is why does Imam Ali have to ask Aqil? 
Yeah. Because, you know, in Shia belief, Imam Ali alayhi salam is this person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may inspire with knowledge of that which is not known, knowledge of the unseen. Yeah, sure. He is the gate to the city of knowledge. Absolutely. Um, which Absolutely. is the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. Yes. So why would Imam Ali alayhi salam ask Aqil? Is it because he was older? One angle, oh, one may argue, out of respect, that's his older brother. Because Imam Ali alayhi salam had three elder brothers. Mm -hmm. Talib, Aqil, and Ja'far. Right. So, one may argue, one angle is that he wanted to ask the advice of his elder brother. But the reality of the uh -huh. whole story is that Aqil was a person renowned for his knowledge of genealogies. SubhanAllah. Uh, the Arabs used to pride themselves yeah. on who used to know the Nasab and the Ansab. Okay, okay. And until today, many of us will say, you know, what's your Nasab? Where are you from? Which, right. which Sadat are you from? Which group are you yes, from? Which city yes. are you from? Which village are you from? Some people will not marry except if they know, you know, the Nasab and the Hasab and the back and the forth. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what happens in this particular incident. Because Imam Ali alayhi salam knows that his brother Aqil is a master of genealogy. Right. There is uh, uh, maybe a hagiographical hey um, story where they say that Aqil uh, one day Muawiyah made a big dinner and a you know quite lavish, lavish event feast. Right. feast for Aqil. Okay. Now, how Aqil got to Syria? Was Aqil blind? How old was he? I leave this for another discussion where we look at I the see. sources. Yeah. But let's just go with the story that Aqil and Muawiyah supposedly are having this discussion. And Muawiyah knows very well that Aqil is not just the brother of Imam Ali, but Aqil is a master of the Ansab, master so, of the genealogies. So really, his fame was well known. Well it wasn't known. Just, not just in the family. Yeah, it was, it was well, well known. known. And right. so what happens is that... Muawiyah asks Aqil. There are a number of people who are sitting around. And Muawiyah asks Aqil, you're the master of the Ansab. Tell me about Amr ibn al-As's Nasab. What's the family tree of Amr ibn al-As? And Aqil made it clear that if you want to ask, know about the genealogy of Amr ibn al-As, six different people claimed they were his father. Clearly, in the days of Jahiliya, Amr ibn al-As had a, had a job where many men were welcome on an hourly mm. basis. Mm. And then, um, of course, I always, I, I always mention that إِنَّا عَطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَارِ yes. فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرِ إِنَّ شَانِئَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْتَارِ Shani is your most severe enemy. Someone okay. who has amount of hate for you. Abtar is when you, you have no continuation of your line. If an animal's so tail was cut off, they'd call it Abtar. Okay. al As bin uh -huh. Wa'il used to be the one who used to make fun of the Prophet when his baby son dies, dies saying that your line's cut off. The Quran said, no, no, no. Your most severe enemy, his line is the one that is cut. Right. Meaning that al As was not the real dad of Amr. Okay. So when Aqil therefore said that six different people claimed they were the father, Muawiyah then asked, well, how did you find out who the father was? And they said, well, Six different names, we picked a name out. Whichever name was shown on the paper, we said that that's his name. So he was called Amr ibn al-As. Now, then uh, Muawiyah says, how about my family tree? Yeah. And the reply comes that um, uh, if you want to ask about your family tree, go ask Arabia what your grandma's job was, then you'll know your family tree. Now, Muawiyah is not someone who just takes something like that lightly because Aqil just ripped his grandma. He's made it clear to him that, you know what, your grandma had a particular profession. You can find out what your nasab is from there. Muawiyah turned around to Aqil and he said to him, he said, Aqil, how's your uncle Abu Lahab? Is he still burning in hell? Because, of course, Aqil's dad is Abu Talib. Who's Abu Talib's brother? Brother. Abu, Abu Lahab. Lahab. Of course. Muawiyah got Aqil back. But then Aqil replied to him, he's in hell next to your... Auntie Um Jamil. Because oh. who was Abu Lahab's wife? Abu Sufyan's sister. sister. Muawiyah's aunt. aunt. So what you have here is this interesting confrontation that occurs. But the, 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 the main discussion in this whole confrontation is that Aqil is a master of 
the genealogy. Okay. He's gifted. Yeah. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, when wanting to get married, Aqil used to lay out uh, a small mat okay. in the mosque of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family in Medina. And people would come and see Aqil and they'd ask him questions about genealogies. And so Imam Ali alayhi salam comes and asks his brother, okay. I want you to find me a lady from whose line there are the most brave and valiant of warriors. That's the criteria. I see. Now, does that mean that Imam Ali is not looking for akhlaq? Imam Ali is not looking for No, that's a given. When Imam Ali alayhi salam tells you, I want to marry somebody, you don't then turn around and say, Are you, but you mentioned bravery, you didn't mention religion. No, no, you know that Imam Ali alayhi salam, religion, akhlaq, these are all fundamental. But the Imam Ali alayhi salam said, I want a special trait. Okay. Find me a lady whose dad's 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 dad are ferocious warriors. That if I'm going to have sons from this lady, these sons are going to be full of valor, full of bravery, but with a real, and this is the fundamental word, okay. chivalry. Right. In Arabic, we talk of futuwa. Okay. La fata illa Ali. Wa la saifun illa Dhulfiqah. Futuwa is not, you know, sometimes people translate this as there is no youth but Ali. Mm, that's right, in English. And yes. that there is no sword but Dhulfiqah. No, there is no chivalrous. Right. It's the weakness of English in the translation. Ah, chivalry. A composite of virtues found in one personality from their teens, possibly till the age of 40. Just, forgiving, generous, brave. This is what yeah. we're looking for. Okay. And this is, this is, Unique this colors. Futuwa yeah. existed in many of the many different schools in Islam would talk of Futuwa. Some would learn swordsman skin, mm. skills. Some would learn ancient martial arts and samurai skills, but while maintaining a discipline of food and patience and so on. Right. It's as if that chivalry, that Futuwa is what many want to come back. And I'll give you an example of what Futuwa could mean in today's society. Yeah, sure. You're on a bus. Uh -huh. You're sitting and there's a lady standing. Futuwa is when a person says, please you sit down, Bismillah, I'll yeah. stand up. Okay. You're okay. about to enter a restaurant. And your missus is with you. Some will just open the door, go straight, and some will say, no, ladies first. That's chivalry. Chivalry is not just a person who's skilled with the sword. Okay. But rather, chivalry is also somebody who at times their heart is soft. At times, they are swordsman-like. At times, they are noble, generous. They're altruistic, all in one personality. Right. And so Imam Ali alayhi salam asks Aqil, Aqil tells him, I'll get back to you in a month. Okay. Or give me a month. Right. You give me a month and I'm going to get back to you. Now, it's interesting the connotations regarding matchmaking today. Yeah, yeah. Because I believe that in our communities, matchmaking is very undervalued. Right. And I believe that we should focus greatly on matchmaking. Because there are so many wonderful brothers and sisters out there, but they're not getting the chance to meet each other. And True. we need to develop innovative methods. And I know sometimes people come to me with different methods which have been innovated regarding matchmaking, and I find people mocking these methods. I don't see a reason why they should be mocked. Yeah. So for example, there's people out there who are talking about, let's say, speed dating. You know, you go to these events, if you, you talk to somebody for like a minute and then you move mm -hmm. on and you mention, well, I like that person. So I think more of these events are needed. Yes. I do believe that our mosques should also open up a little bit in allowing the brothers and sisters to get to know each other better. But what's interesting is that Imam Ali alayhi salam highlighted there is a great reward in the person who brings two people together. I don't know what your experiences are, you know, of the matchmaking world. Yes. But I believe that, you know, well, it's something usually, we should usually, give a lot more support for our community. I think usually it's just by word of mouth, introduction, well, I know so and so, and that's it really. But there isn't anything more than that. Mm. So I think you're quite right that there is um, a lack of vision and a lack of dialogue required. And also people, you know, are, are sort of still in that mode that, well, it's not right as it were, but you know, you've got to move in a halal way, as it were, that where we can actually exercise, you know, 
um, meetings in terms of compatibility, you're right. Um, and that's not clearly happening at the moment. So hopefully, inshallah, that will change going forward, inshallah. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, so we've spoken about matchmaking and how we can actually learn from this. And you've given wonderful insight, I must say, in terms of his um, brother, Aqil. Um, so from the marriage, the matrimony of Amir al Mu'minin. Islam and Umm uh, al-Bani Islam Islam. It's interesting. They have four sons, if I'm not mistaken. And what are exactly the names of the four sons? And you know, uh, what do they represent, as it were? You know, what what happens, as it were? Well, what happens is that Aqil gets back to Imam Ali Islam, and he says to him that I found you a lady by the name of Fatima. Al mm -hmm. And he begins to tell him the names of her family members. And the reason he tells Imam Ali السلام, the names of the people in her in her ansab, mm -hmm. in her nasab, is because he wants Imam Ali to tell him, yes, th this is the people who I know will ensure that these traits have continued or that the sons that I have in the future will be sons who uh, will have those traits. So Aqil tells him, well, do you know Amr bin Sa'sa? Sa and Imam Ali says, of course, one of the bravest warriors in Arabian history. Right. He says to him, do you know also one of her ancestors is Mula'ab al Asinna? He says to him, yes, of course. So Aqil begins to list the people in the family tree of, of Umm al-Banin. And, and Imam Ali السلام, when he hears these names, he recognizes that these are the names that will definitely mean I'll have some brave sons. Right. And, you know, when she, when she gets married, you know, her father accepts the proposal straight away. Okay. He is absolutely in honor of the fact, oh, you know, he's elated that Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam is the one who's come to propose for my daughter. Yeah. And the daughter from the very beginning made it clear, I have not come into this house okay. to be a burden on... Hassan and Hussein, Zainab and Kulthum. On the contrary, I am a servant to them, for they are the grandchildren of the Prophet, peace be upon his family. You know, it can be it can be quite intimidating for somebody of to go into a house where you have, you know, you're already seen as the stepmom, and then yeah, on top yeah, of absolutely. that, you've got the the kids there as well, and they're at a young age, and they've you know been through a traumatic experience in their young age. But what you find is that. She, she walks in and from the very beginning for her it's an honor. Right. And, and then Imam Ali alayhi salam, you know, he, he treats her in the best of ways. She has a real closeness to Imam Ali alayhi salam. Remember, Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he marries her, still in his 30s. Okay. You know, yeah. he's, you're not talking somebody who's in his 50s. He's still in the prime of his life. Um, and he marries her and they have these four sons. Right. <clears throat> Abbas, Ja'far, uh, Abdullah, and Uthman. Sometimes I've seen in historical mm -hmm. narrations, and sometimes it's difficult to reconstruct the biographies of these okay. great personalities because scarce material out there, and you really have to work your socks off to try and find uh, <clears throat> names and dates and so on, especially with the anti uh, the anti. Um, Talibid propaganda that existed from the Umayyads and the Abbasids. Yes. But what you have is that you've got Abbas and Abdullah, Uthman and Ja'far. And each one, their name has a different meaning. And I think this is something very yeah, this, important. Okay. Spoiler. Because I have heard some absurd names really? in our communities recently. Absurd in the sense that either someone's just gone on Google and typed cool name. And it's just come out with the most absurd name, but just because he'll fit into society, right. or his wife will fit into her friend circle. Or it's chic, according to them. <clears throat> chic, or even it's just like, according well, to them, it's it has some Islamic connotation. Right. And the Islamic connotation is some you know, crazy sect that existed in the 12th century, or one of the fighters against Imam al Hussein at Karbala. But anyway, so when you look at the Adil Bayt, Abbas is a name they that is important to them. Ja'far is a name that's important to them. Abbas, he names him Abbas. He, wa he wants him to have 
this particular insight and foresight okay. where he is able to pierce through the lines of the enemy just by looking, looking. at them. Yes. There's a frown, but a frown of a man of dignity and honor. Uh, <coughs> so he, they have these sons. And, um, and you find that there is this wonderful marriage that takes place in a very turbulent period, by you, because right. Imam Ali, السلام, when he becomes uh, Khalifa, he has to move from Medina to Kufa. Mm -hmm. And Umm al banin goes with him. And sometimes for, for some ladies in marriages, having to travel from one place to another, it can really you know, take its toll on the marriage. But you never ever find Umm al banin ever complaining to Imam Ali alayhi salam that look, I've been raised in Medina for the last 25, 30 years of my life, you're taking me to Kufa. No, on the contrary. They're there, Abbas, Ja'far, Abdullah, Abdullah and Uthman. Uthman. Okay, and, and approximately, we'll come to, we'll just extend the theme of the names as it were in a moment or two, but what, approximately what were the ages of the four sons as it were, when they migrated to, um, were to they very Kufa? young? Were they, I yeah, mean, they're, just all for the young. Viewers, they're all just, young. Just for the viewers, how much younger were they than Hasnain alayhi salam and Bibi Zainab salam alayhi salam? They were Is at it? least, I, I would say they were at least 20 years younger. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Quite at least 20 years younger. Right. Yeah. Okay, and now you mentioned the names. Yeah. And we're going to go to a break in the next few minutes, but just before, just to continue this theme of names. Because for Zainab, Abbas is like a younger brother. Yeah, right. You know, that, right. that feeling of having a younger brother. Yes. You know, there's, yes. between Zainab and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, there's at least a 22-year age gap. Okay. Yep. And so, so you've mentioned that these four uh, signs, as it were, some actually people doubt, or some people, there's traditions about Uthman al-Islam as one of the signs. What? What can you mention about that, as it were? Well, I think Imam, sometimes this comes up. Yeah, I think, I think history books show that Imam Ali um, had a son by the name of Uthman. Some narrations mention that Imam Ali had a son by the name of Omar. Right. And um, there were great personalities mm -hmm. uh, who were called Uthman, who were called Omar, such as Uthman bin Mad'un, such as Omar bin Muqrin. Right. And nobody has a freehold on any name, probably except Allah and His Prophet. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, we'll just continue to show in the next moment or two. But uh, viewers, um, please do, do join us this Thursday. This Thursday is the 21st of February. Um, there will be a special program this Thursday, Ed, live. Um, and the topic of the show will be, I am Husseini. Um, what exactly does it mean to be Husseini? Are we doing justice to the name of Imam Hussein al-Islam? How can we finance initiatives? and projects and so on and so forth. We'll have uh, special guests on Thursday, Friday, and also Saturday. Um, and we'll be taking live calls. So it will be a fascinating insight in terms of new material and also give you an opportunity to voice your uh, questions, speak to guests as it were, telephone in as well, uh, and more. So please do join us uh, on Thursday as well, inshallah, 8 p.m. That's 21st of February. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Sayyidina, uh, we're just going to be going to a break in the next few minutes. Um, but um, just in terms of um, if her name, and we might need to come revisit this uh, just after the break. Uh, if her name is Fatima, then why do we refer to her as Umm al -Banin? If you can probably uh, perhaps shed some light on that. Sure, the narrations... And it's always sad okay. when you hear this, but yeah. the narrations mention that she requests for a name change. As soon now, as she it marries a, a yes. Imam Ali al -Islam. Why? Whenever he calls her Fatima, there's a sadness enveloped on the faces of Fatima to Zahra's children. Because they, at that moment, remember the oppression and the torture. Mm -hmm and the injustice that was meted out against their mother. Okay, we'll say now we'll just have to come back to that. Yes. We're going for a short break. Viewers, do join us again uh, for this fascinating uh, topic today on inspirational women. See you in a moment or two.
Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV. The theme tonight is inspirational women and we're looking at the personality of Umm al-Baneen, salam alaykum. Viewers do call in um, to um, pose your questions to Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. The telephone number for WhatsApp is 07939-917-163. Once again, 07939-917-163. Alternatively, you can also call in on a landline, 0203-515-0199. Sayyidina, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa We just prior to the break, we were, you were touching on um, the name of uh, Fatima and why we actually refer to her as Umm al -Banin. So if we can probably just go back to that point. Yeah, as I mentioned, um, she is the one who mm. altruistically, uh, it, it really is an unbelievable moment in my opinion yeah. in, in her life. Because you've been given this name Fatima by your parents. It's a great name. But you notice that there's a sadness etched on the face of the orphans mm -hmm. known as Hassan and Hussein. Yes. Zainab and Kulthum. And therefore she tells Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, change my name. Why? Because whenever you mention Fatima, this brings pain on the young ones. Now, a couple of important points. <sighs> Firstly, Ahlul Bayt والسلام, are so hurt by what happened to their mother Fatima. It couldn't have just been a natural death, death. because of sadness or depression. When Umm al banin sees that the grandchildren of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, are distraught when they hear the name Fatima. Second lesson is that Ahl al-Bayt always come ahead of our interests. There are many moments where we have to ask ourselves a question. I want to do something, but mm -hmm. would Ahl al-Bayt be pleased? Yeah, yes. Because their pleasure is ultimately the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. True. No what she does at that moment is says, even though my name Fatima is so important for me, if it brings less sadness to the family of the Prophet, that I have another name, then so be it, let me have another name. Does she take another name on? Imam Ali Islam picks for her Umm al Okay. Umm al banin means literally the mother of the sons. I see. I You've see. got these sons, Abbas and, and his brothers. And therefore, this will be your title. And subhanAllah, until today, when you talk of Fatima, you talk of Fatima as Zahra. Zahra. When you talk of Umm al she has her own oh, place. SubhanAllah. There is no way whatsoever that Umm al could have envisaged all those years back that people would admire her because of the name that Imam Ali salam gives her. Okay. Because of the name that she herself says, I want my name changed. So in this one incident of the name change, we see the meaning of not just what Fatima al Zahra's martyrdom, its effect on, on the family of the Prophet, but also how placing Ahl al-Bayt's interest and happiness, and that's why in Ziyara we always say, Bi Abi anta wa umri. May my mother and my father, may my father and my mother be sacrificed for you. When we say I'm at peace with whoever you are at peace mm. with, I'm at war with whoever you're at war with. I take as a guardian those who you ask me to take as a guardian. I'm an enemy of those who you saw as enemies. This is when a person takes Ahl al-Bayt ahead of themselves. And that one incident highlights this. SubhanAllah. Thank yes. you so much, Sayyidina. Um, so now we have questions. Um, Salam, in what year did Bibi Umm al banin die? Was it a natural death or was she martyred? She dies in the 64th year 
after Hijrah, and I will come to Inshallah. it towards the end of the show okay. when we discuss her natural death. Okay. Um, what, Salam, what was the age of Mullah Hassan and Hussein when Fatima, Fatima Zahra salam, salam, was attacked? Eight and seven. Right. Okay, so those two questions have been answered now. Um, just moving on swiftly because we've got, I think, just 25 minutes, Sina, um, viewers. That, um, so if you can call in, please do call in quickly because we only have about 20, 25 minutes for tonight's show. Um, we, you've very eloquently, I must say, you know, mentioned the sacrifice, almost as it were, she's let her ego go, you know, made sure that, you know, her name isn't mentioned, as it were. But in terms of Imam Ali's last moments now, um, and in his last moments, he ensures that the pledge is made, the passing on, as it were, of Imamat is made to Imam Hassan alayhi And what, what exactly happens to Abbas, Abu Fadl Abbas alayhi as it were, at that time? What, you know, in terms of what is his state? What, is, is Umul Banin worried about him? What happens, as it were, when everyone's asked to give your pledge, give your allegiance, give your bayah, as it were, to Imam Hassan alayhi and the continuation, then what happens then? Imam Ali alayhi salam dies in the 40th year after Hijrah at the age of 57. And what you find with Imam Ali alayhi salam is that when he passes away, uh, sorry, at the age of 63, uh, when he when he passes away, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he leaves a, a will behind to his sons. Right. And that will was for them to all pledge allegiance. To who? To Imam al Hassan. Hassan alayhi salam. Because yeah. Imam al Hassan is the Imam after Imam Ali alayhi salam. Naturally. And there is this narration that he asks Imam al Hussein, come pledge allegiance to Imam al Hassan asks his other sons who are alive at the time, let's say Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya and others, and Umm al-Banin comes and asks him, you asked everybody, you requested them that they all come and pledge their allegiance to Muhammad mm. Hassan, how about my Abbas? Yeah, this is quite a poignant point in mm. history. Why? Mm. Why so? Because... Because it's as if there's this message being given. Okay. That Abbas and Hussein, your relationship is unique. Now this doesn't negate that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam will be the most loyal to Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam. We know when Imam al-Hassan died, nobody was hurt as much as Abu al-Fadl next to Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Okay. And Abu al-Fadl was angered by those who attacked the janazah, the funeral of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam. Uh, however, Imam Amir al-Mu'min tells Abu al fadl your pledge is to also look after Imam al Hussein. There'll be a day you remain loyal to him. Mm -hmm. That is the day you were created for. Subhanallah. And no doubt, when and he we knew come that to that well. day, when we come to that day, there is no loyalty like Abu al fadl Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, just now moving on swiftly, Abu Fadl al Abbas al Islam. Um, he gets married. So what I want to know, and I'm sure most viewers probably do not know this actually, um, but who actually does he get married to? And what role does Umm al-Banin have, as it were, in making that choice, if, if any? Yeah, it's interesting. I remember when I gave my lecture on the life of the wife of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam a few years ago, and the lecture can be found online on okay. Lababa, okay. the wife of Abbas. Many said to me they did not know until that day what the name was yeah. of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas's wife. She was from the Abbasid line, from the line of Abbas, the uncle of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. Mm. 
And she had a really traumatic experience at a young age right. because her, her brothers were beheaded by Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan's governor, Basar bin Arta. Okay. And she, even though seeing her brothers beheaded, her iman remained very strong. And this affected Umm al -Banin. Umm al saw her and thought, you know, it's not easy for a young girl to see her brothers beheaded. But for her to see her brothers beheaded and to remain strong, not affected seemingly, this would make a great wife for Abel Fadl. And she was like, you know, his second cousin and so on. Okay, so they, and were, they were cousins. They were cousins, yes. And, and, and so Umm al is extremely happy, but she wants approval. Okay. From Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. It's as if uh -huh. Abbas, you cannot do anything unless your brother Hussein gives the green light. Now, Abba, Abba Abdullah is not that type of person who's going to stand with a gun saying, if I do not give you a green light, you cannot move on. Yeah. But it was that respect <clears throat> that has existed. Sure. Um, and so they ask Imam al Hussein, Lubaba, the daughter of Abaydullah ibn al Abbas, what's your opinion? And Imam al Hussein approves. And they get married. Yes. It's, so, uh, it, so they're second cousins. Yeah. So just in terms of that, if we just extend that to today in this modern era, there's no problem as it were cousins getting married as it were. In Islamic like. law, there's no issue with cousins getting married yeah. or second cousins getting married. You know, Imam Ali alayhi salam married Fatima Zahra and she was his second cousin. Sure. And, you know, Abel Fadl Abbas marries Lubaba and she was his mm -hmm. uh, second cousin. However... Of course, if a person is given medical advice that there has been a continuous stream of cousin marriages mm -hmm. which could result in something fatal or something difficult to handle, then they should take the medical advice. And in terms of the relationship now, and this is quite key as well because we've spoken previously about <coughs> divorces, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship. What was the relationship like? And because viewers actually should take something away from this show, as it were, and also from this great personality of Umm al Bani Salam alayhi What was the relationship, the mother-in-law and also, you know, the daughter-in-law relationship? Yeah, Umm um, al We, we um, should take this. As sure, well. sure. I think, you know, I hear some really bad examples about how some father and mother-in-laws treat their daughter-in-law. Recently, I heard a case where I was told that there is a father and a mother-in-law, they expect their daughter-in-law to live at home with them. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, if the daughter-in-law doesn't live at home with them, meaning yes. that she tells her husband, let's live somewhere else, they'll, they'll cause trouble for the daughter-in-law and for their own son. Yes. I heard a story once of a mother-in-law who expected that when she would wake up, her daughter should be awake to make her breakfast. Yeah. I've heard stories of unbelievable torture on daughter-in-laws where they are expected to act like slaves. Mm. And this, by the way, is from religious families, not non-religious families. So-called religious families who's, you know, who's, who've got maulanas in their families treat their daughter-in-laws in some of the worst ways. And you'd expect a family that has you know, people who are, who are you know, learned in the faith to be people of respect, but you find even the ones who look religious can treat their wife in a way where they'll tell her that, listen, you are the slave of my parents. Believe you me, don't let the appearance fool you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the ones who look the most religious are the ones who met out the most oppression against their families. Yeah. And so what you find is that Umm al-Banin is extremely soft-hearted. Right. When you have a son like Abbas, <clears throat> who has the softest heart, as displayed in the heroics of the 10th of Muharram, where he could not bear to drink water while his brother, his master, his niece, his sister were thirsty, then what do you think of the mother of Abbas? She was an extremely soft-hearted lady. There is not a single narration in any books, both the books that praise Ahlul Bayt, the books that try and find problems with the legacy of Ahlul Bayt, not a single narration that she ever raised her voice against her daughter-in-law, that she ever forced her to be awake at times of the night. 
just to be a slave to her father-in-law. This, this is the lessons that we need to take. Yeah, absolutely. When absolutely. I hear that there are parts of India and Pakistan where daughter-in-laws are literally slaves. They, they haven't got married. They've just become a slave with the title married. married. This is something extremely sad and far away from the ethos set by Umm al -Banin. Okay, um, so now we have a question. Salam, quick question for clarity. Did Imam Ali -Islam give Umm al -Bani, Islam, Islam that title early on in the marriage? Um, basically, and also that um, it's mentioned that she had sons, uh, but this person thought that it was given to her early in the marriage as she didn't want to say the Fatima to grief or the children to feel grief early on. Um, so was it, uh, was it, uh, uh, was well, it just uh, on the I think, there, I think there's an argument for both. Okay. I've never ever come across a date mm -hmm. which says, for example, on June the 27th, you know, 38 AH, that was that day. I've never come across anything like that. But I think it works both ways. Yes. It makes sense that it's early yes. because obviously being called Fatima in front of these young kids and it's causing them pain and the fact that they are now moving on in their lives. So I think it must have been extremely early when this was given. Mm. Um, and, you know, Ahlul Bayt can give you a title, the mother of sons, knowing what could happen in the future. Okay, yep. so we had another question, and this question has been answered, but I'll just read it out, um, because uh, Sayyidina, Dr. Sayyidina Ma Naqshwani has already answered this question, that how many sons did Umm al Bani Islam al -Islam have? Um, so, and also, how was she introduced, as it were, to him? So that's also been answered on today's show as well. So I do urge you to watch the rerun, as it were, on YouTube in Mama Sain TV channel. Um, but the other part of the question is interesting in that uh, which sons were present or martyred in Karbala? Um, so I'm not sure if you want to answer it now or later on or how you want to. No, no. All four sons were present and right. all four died as martyrs on the 10th of Muhammad. Okay, yeah. fine. Um, so we have just have about 10, 12 minutes left. Um, just moving on. Um, so you've mentioned... Also, you know, the relationship that she had, as it were, with her daughter-in-law um, and how she treated her, as it were. Um, what are the narrations, as it were? What does history tell us about her? Was she present in Karbala? And, and if not, why not, as it were? What, what yeah, there, there's a few personalities who were not present at Karbala. Mm. Some reasons we know, some we don't. Okay. Why Kumail was not at Karbala, we don't okay. know. And yet he was alive. At he was alive. Why Qambar was not at Karbala, we don't know. Okay. Why, for example, uh, Ibn Abbas or Muhammad ibn Hanafi, Abdullah ibn Ja'far, some speculate about eyesight, illness, old age. Right. There are differences of opinion. Um al -Banin, it seems there's an order given from the Ahlul Bayt salam, that she remains behind and that she does look after, for example, Abel al Fadl al-Abbas's young son by the name of Fadl. She yes. is the grandmother who looks after. Okay, yeah. and um, just about half a dozen questions left now, Sayyidina. Um, so, it's natural for any mother to be waiting, as it were, from a different land, okay, um, or a different part of the world geographically, that the sons are fighting in Karbala. What, what impact? Could this have had on her uh, and you know it must have been hard for her waiting as it were being patient god only knows god only yeah. knows how difficult it is you know if a, if a mother sent her son mm -hmm. or daughter to college she's anxiously waiting when they've turned up five minutes or ten minutes they haven't turned up late imagine over a month and not hearing news or hearing news but not being able to verify from someone like Zainab salam, because it's over a month until they return back from Karbala. Yeah. And she can only be so strong. It must have been difficult. But one thing interesting about mm. her, Imam al Hussein salam, is more important to her and his survival than even her own sons. Yes, yes. Remember, Ahl al Bayt first. First, first and foremost. May yeah. my sons be sacrificed for the family of the Prophet. And that's a slogan for all of our lives. Subhanallah, yeah. subhanallah. So, uh, there's a uh, person by the name of Bishar bin Hathlam, I yes. believe. I hope I pronounced that correct. 
and he brings back the news, the, you know, the really sad news, as it were, uh, to Umm al Bani Salam Islam, when she's residing, as it were, in Medina. How does she react when she knows and hears about her four sons have been slain? The yeah, Abishr bin Hadlam brings the news to Medina. She is narrated to have held Abu al-Fadl Abbas's son. She's holding him and she then asks. This is Fadl himself. Yeah. yeah. She asks, is there news from Karbala? What's happening? And, and, and he asks, who is it? They said, don't you know who that is? That's Umm al-Baneen. The moment he hears that's Umm al-Baneen, he says, may Allah give you reward for the death of your son, Abdullah. You'd think a mother at this moment would break down. Yeah, that would yeah, be it. Absolutely. She says, tell me about Abba Abdullah. May Allah give you reward over the death of your son, Uthman. She says, tell me about Hussein. May Allah reward you over the death of your son, Jafar. Tell me about the son of Fatima the Zahra. But of course, the next line breaks her. May Allah give you patience and reward you over the death of your son Abbas. She drops the child because Abbas was everything to her. Yeah. Abbas was her life. But so was Hussein. Of course. And Hussein's her Imam. Yes. And so she gathers herself. Tell me about Abba Abdullah. You will never, ever see devotion and loyalty because that's the recipe of success to the family of the Prophet, peace be upon them, like Umm al Banin. The first thing she wants to do is look for Zainab. Because she knows that A, Zainab never traveled except with Hussein on one side and Abbas awesome. on the other. Yeah. Yeah. B, Zainab's going to need a backbone for her now. In the way Hussein was a backbone, Ab Abbas was a backbone for Imam Hussein. Yes. And Sayyidah Zainab is narrated to have told Sayyidah Fidda. Okay. Or Bibi Fidda that don't let anyone in the house. But then when Bibi Fidda hears the knocking on the door, she turns around and she says, Say that it's Umm al -Banin. and It's this moment, if you put this into a film, Zainab seeing Umm al -Banin, Umm al -Banin seeing Zainab, and Zainab calling out, Wa Abbas, oh Abbas. And Umm al -Banin calling out, Wa Hussein. And this incident breaks her heart, yeah. and it's very difficult for her to recover. Because not only has she lost her beloved boys, but she's lost the person who she admired more than all, and that was Hussein. Hussein. This is very difficult for a few, few years after Karbala. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, great lessons of sacrifice and uh, obedience, as it were, and you know, servanthood. Um, we've just got about six or seven minutes to now, so we're just going to wrap up with the next three, four, with the next three, four questions. Um, we often commemorate Majalis um, now in honor of, you know, the Shahada of Karbala, uh, peace be upon all of them. What did she specifically do to honor uh, the Shahada, as it were, living in Medina? Was there something specific, as it were, that, you know, the viewers really ought to know, as it were? She was a renowned poet, and that's uh -huh. why I, I would love to hear more and more of our sisters who are writing Qasidas, Nohas, Marthiyas, in honor of the Ahlul Bayt right. Because that's what she did. And she'd recite the Masaib of Ahlul Bayt. She'd find it an honor to be of those who recite the Masaib. And I think there are many sisters out there who are very, very, uh, very able, mm. very eloquent, very literate, well-educated, write about Karbala. Yes. Do a journal article on Karbala, a book on Karbala, mm. a poem on Karbala. And she would go to Jannat al baqir Okay. Put five different houses. 
or five graves, small graves. And you know, we all know she's buried in Baqiyah. Yes, when you yes, walk in Jannah Baqiyah, the four Imams of Ahlul Bayt are on the right, right and she's to the left. left. May right. Allah bless all the viewers Inshallah that they visit, visit Jannah al Baqiyah very soon. Inshallah. And what you have is that she would sit there and she'd remember Karbala. Mm -hmm. And it instituted for us that wherever you are in the world, organize majalis. Organize majalis in your houses. Because Umm al Bani and Sayyidah Zainab, the strength of their majalis is what ensured Karbala remained alive. To the extent there are narrations that say Marwan ibn al Hakam mm -hmm. was of those who would start crying when witnessing Umm al Bani in Baqiya. And this person's heart is sadly you know, made of stone and an Umayyad heart. And, yeah. and even he got affected by that. Right, okay. Um, Communities worldwide, okay, um, we sometimes, we have a sufra, as it were, for Umm al Banin, salam alayhi um, Some people, Asian communities, you know, will naturally make, you know, curries, some other communities may make bread, cheese, as it were. Um, other communities may actually distribute sweet dishes. Is this actually Islamic, as it were, you know, in terms of commemorating any, or remembering, you know, this great I lady? think any, any, food mm -hmm. which is cooked and given to the poor and the needy yeah. or brings love between the community in honor of one of the Ahlul Bayt is something meritorious. Right. We're not going to say there is an actual narration called Sufrat Umm al Banin or Khubz al Abbas or Lad or, or this uh, Kir, mm -hmm. Halim, mm -hmm. all of these things. I can't say there is an actual hadith for that. Yes. But doing a nither, yes, <clears throat> mannat, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. honor of such a lady, no yes. doubt, if it brings us closer to her and helps to for the, uh, you know, feed the poor and the orphans and the needy, why not? Okay, yeah. well, so now we just literally have a moment or two, so I'll be very quick. Um, we often hear about the power of Fatiha for Umm al Bani Islam and Islam and Amal. Um, is this discussed by ulama? So that's, I'm being very quick now, and also. What lessons has affected you, Sayyidina, from her? In Very terms of quickly. ulama, ulama always say that whenever you are in difficulty, I, I've, I've met a couple of ulama who have said, when you're in difficulty, do a hundred salawat on okay. Muhammad and Al Muhammad and dedicate them to Umm al Banin. Okay. Others have said, recite Al Fatiha for Umm al Banin. Others mention A'mal for Umm al Banin, where there is a particular two rak'ah prayer and salawats to be done, and you know, the books will show you all the mm -hmm. details. Ahlul Bayt loved Umm al-Banin so much that Shahid al-Thani, may Allah bless his soul, he mentions how they would do ziyara of Umm al-Banin on the day of Eid. You know many people go to the Maqbar or the Qabristan, mm -hmm. Ahlul Bayt would go. Okay. And like I said, if you ever face a difficult time in terms of your loyalty to the Ahlul Bayt, um, tests in maintaining your religiosity, tests in maintaining your devotion, tests in having lost those who you love. Yes. Just look at this lady's biography. 60 years, 4 AH till 64 AH, but 60 wonderful years. Okay. And it's a shame yes. that there are millions of Muslims Mm -hmm. who do not know anything about her life. Okay, very briefly, if you can just quickly wrap up the show, because unfortunately we've almost run out of time. Just what's affected you, um, you know, from uh, in life? And also, you know, viewers, do please join us again on Thursday, Friday and Saturday for the special show that I have mentioned. Say so now, if you can just quickly wrap up the show uh, very briefly in terms of what lessons you I can... I'll leave, I'll leave the viewers yeah. with one line. Yeah. And that is if Abbas is Bab al Hawaij, then imagine if you ask Allah through Abbas's mother. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Yeah, and uh, whenever you're in trouble, a fatha for Umm al Banin and a fatha for Abu Talib. Islam. You should be okay. Inshallah. Viewers, we've run out of time. Inshallah, see you again next time. Inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. <laughs>